who has no connection with reality. In February 1947, the British government made a dramatic declaration. They would definitely leave India by June 1948. But there was still no agreement on how to give India to the Indians. With chaos spreading, they decided on a radical solution to appoint a new viceroy. The scene is Northolt Airfield, the occasion the departure of Lord Mountbatten of Burma, who was leaving for India with his wife. Before the new Viceroy, there lay the task of holding office for the brief but obviously difficult period of just over a year until the date when Indians are to take full control of India. Everyone in Britain, I'm certain, wishes the Viceroy all possible success in India. I was in school and they said, you, you'll miss the last term of school um, and we're taking you out in the middle of this term because Dad has been appointed Viceroy of India and so we're going out for probably a couple of years and uh, you know thought we'd take you as well because you can be useful. In March 1947 Mountbatten arrived in India. The former supreme allied commander of Southeast Asia had a reputation for being a decisive leader, a man who could knock heads together. His brief was simple, to get a deal and get Britain out before India imploded. The swearing in, uh, of course, was a, a very great ceremony in the Darbar Hall. And so trumpeters and all the uh, staff in their full dress uniform, my father in full dress uniform, my mother in a long white dress, and I think a sort of laurel wreaths in her hair. And, they looked like film stars. The Viceroy, his wife Edwina the Viceroyn, and their daughter Pamela moved into Viceroy's house in New Delhi with its staff of 5,000. In Viceroy's house, there were indoor gardeners. Now the indoor gardeners just arranged the flowers in the vases and changed the water. And there were 25 of them as indoor gardeners. There was one man who spent his entire time with a seal that bore the British crown stamping the butter pads. And there was another unfortunate man known as the chicken plucker who did nothing else. So the scale was so amazing. Narendra Singh Sarila was to become Mountbatten's aide-de-camp, his personal assistant. Among other things, his job was to assist on tiger hunts. Lord Mountbatten was a very articulate man and uh, he used to uh, plan ahead what he's going to do. And, and he used to carry it through, ruthlessly. Despite the formalities of life at Viceroy's house, Mountbatten seemed like a new breed of Viceroy. First of all, his background helped him, because everybody knew that he was cousin of the king. But still, he, was, he acted without any heirs. And I think that impressed Indians because otherwise Royce kept, uh, you know, the sort of upper lip and uh, that sort of thing. And, and I think that helped to impress people. Well, the first thing that was different with my father and mother was that when they were entertaining, I mean, they were in India, they invited Indians, which had never happened before. I mean, yes, of course, Indian princes um, were, were entertained. But the ordinary um, Indian um, ministers and lawyers and doctors or whoever um, had never been invited, so they, that was uh, quite a, a new thing. On the personal level, Dickie was a very charming, very handsome, uh, very lovable person who met one uh, very informally 
and you know when one was very young and rather nervous in front of important people he could put one at one's ease he was awfully sweet Mountbatten's first task was to meet the Indian leaders Mahatma Gandhi and Pandit Nehru for Congress and Muhammad Ali Jinnah for the Muslim League He hoped his more informal style would give him greater success than his stuffier predecessors. They, they, they sat away from the desks in armchairs and uh, were offered refreshments of some kind. And he would, you know, he would say, well, now, before you put me in the picture politically and in the state of India, do tell me a bit about yourself. It was a technique that worked with Nehru the two would become lifelong friends, but it totally failed with Jinnah. He came out of the meeting afterwards and said to his aides, my goodness, he was cold, cold as ice. There were now constant negotiations. As a divided India became a real possibility, the political tensions at the center filtered down to the local level. The Punjab was worst affected. The province was one of the wealthiest in India. Hindus, Muslims and Sikhs all claimed it as their own. The Punjab was home to most of India's six million Sikhs, the location of their most holy site, the Golden Temple. The Sikhs' great fear was that if India was divided, the Punjab, with its Muslim majority, would end up in Pakistan. For Sikhs, it was unthinkable that they would be ruled by the Muslims, historically their enemies. In many villages of the Punjab, communal harmony began to break down. Aridaman Singh Dillon was living in a mixed Sikh Muslim village. I had Muslim friends and we used to play together. And there was nobody from our families put any obstacles between us. But when the strife began, then I was prohibited from going out with my Muslim friends. But we would sneak away and often we'll get caught and scalded. Uh, my grandfather, he noticed us going about uh, playing around in the fields. We try to hide, but ultimately he found out and I was giving a good threshing and scalded. Pai Jassa Singh Ji, Pai Nihal Singh Ji, as a young boy, he watched local politicians stir up divisions between the communities for their own ends. They have to whip up these sentiments of the people and the easiest way to whip up the sentiments of the people are to tell them that their religion is in danger, that their community is in danger. What else would they tell? To hoodwink people, to get votes out of them, to get support out of them. The people had to be hoodwinked and politicians do, that, do this. Tension also increased in the Punjab's capital, Lahore. Student Somanand always had a lot of Muslim friends. They now refused to talk to him. A class fellow of mine raised the Congress flag on the school building. The Muslims were very furious. Why? They also raised their, their Muslim League flag on the, uh, on the school building. So the tension increased. 
the distrust was already there under the surface. It was there for centuries, but now it came above the surface. John Moores and his band of Gurkhas were now sent to Lahore to help the local police keep the peace. We arrived in Lahore around about the 23rd of April. We already knew that there were rumblings going on for intelligence that had been passed to us and we were briefed on that. And our first job was to um, get to know the city and to how to get around it. 